Hi, everyone. Welcome to Unchained, your no-hype resource for all things crypto. I'm your host, Laura Shin. I've been doing a survey, and it's come to my attention that not all of you know that I have another podcast. It's shorter, newsier, and comes out Fridays, and it's called Unconfirmed. If you haven't taken a listen yet, go check it out. In particular, I'd recommend my recent interview with Peter Van Valkenburg of Coin Center on Congress's hearings about Libra. Also, if you're making vacation plans, consider the weekend retreat I'm teaching with Melton Tamiris of CoinShares and Jalik Joban Putra of Future Perfect Ventures. It'll be at the beautiful Omega Institute in Rhinebeck, New York from September 20th to the 22nd. Be sure to check out the show notes for the link to sign up. Grow your crypto and earn up to 8% per year with Crypto.com. It's the place to buy over 40 coins at true cost with no fees and no markups. Download the Crypto.com app today. Kraken is the best exchange in the world for buying and selling digital assets. It has the tightest security, deep liquidity, and a great fee structure with no minimum or hidden fees. Whether you're looking for a simple fiat on-ramp or leveraged options trading, Kraken is the place for you. CypherTrace cutting-edge cryptocurrency intelligence powers anti-money laundering, blockchain analytics, and threat intel. Leading exchanges, virtual currency businesses, banks, and regulators themselves use CypherTrace to comply with regulation and to monitor compliance. My guest for today is Juthika Chow, co-founder and chief operating officer and chief risk officer for Ledger X. Welcome, Juthika. Thanks for having me, Laura. Ledger X reached a major milestone recently, a first for the crypto space. Why don't you tell the listeners what that is? Sure. So Ledger X, we recently um, received a license that allows us to open up our institutional platform to retail investors. Uh, and then more exciting, we recently actually launched it um, to retail investors. So retail investors can have access to the same uh, derivatives, products and options that the Ledger X institutional customer base uh, has been trading for almost two years now. And why don't you elaborate on that? Like, what is it that Ledger X has been doing for the last few years. We are a U.S. federally regulated um, by the CFTC exchange and clearinghouse. Um, and what that really means uh, is that we have a, a platform that allows people to come and trade a wide variety of products from uh, Bitcoin to Bitcoin options um, and, and other sorts of swaps. And then the clearinghouse is the part that guarantees the trade to give the customers um, the safety and security of, um, of knowing that the trades will settle in a regulated manner. And so we had launched that to institutional customers in October of 2017. Um, we were restricted in terms of our license to only uh, allow that to access to institutions. Uh, but we had worked with the regulators um, over the last maybe six to nine months to get a new license um, and really be able to expand that offering so that any customer um, can have access to this you know, highly regulated platform for uh, getting into and out of um, Bitcoin. And I think that's really a key part of our products is that we touch both fiat and Bitcoin. So um, customers can buy a call option and receive actual Bitcoin um, or buy a swap and receive Bitcoin. Um, and so that's an important element that we usually call physically settled derivatives. And for so long in the space, the rallying cry has been HODL or HODL. So why is it that someone would want to buy a derivative of Bitcoin rather than Bitcoin itself? So derivatives and options in particular allow a wide range of uh, exposures and trades that, that people can do that can really enhance um, long positions that they have already. So let's say somebody is long Bitcoin and they do want to hold, but they're not earning any uh, you know, yield or return on their Bitcoin, they can use options to um, to essentially earn some implied yield and um, and generate some return. Uh, similarly, if people want to get le levered exposure um, on the long side, so they can buy call options instead of buying options themselves. Um, and so I think what we see at Ledger X is um, a wide range of customers and customer base coming into trade options um, for a whole bunch of different reasons. I mean, this is why I think options in particular are not zero sum because especially if you deal in the physical, um, they touch, you know, the world outside of the, uh, of just a single trade and, um, and both sides can really benefit depending on their specific considerations and constraints. Why don't we walk through some of those examples? Cause I feel like just talking about it in the abstract can be kind of hard to wrap your mind around, but 
what's let's just start with a call option first just define what that is and then walk me through why someone would per, you know would choose to buy a bitcoin call option so the the standard academic definition um, of an option is that it is the right but not the obligation to purchase uh, an underlying we'll call it bitcoin here at a certain price uh on a certain date in the future. And I think the uh, the way that I like to think about uh, options as opposed to just uh, spot or you know Bitcoin is really the, the last part of that definition, the two components that you do not get if you're just buying or selling Bitcoin. And that is a strike price and an expiration date. So if we want to just buy or sell Bitcoin right now, let's say it's around $10,000, um, I can buy it at 10,000 or I can sell it at 10,000. But if I want to trade a call option, well, now there's a much wider range of uh, trades that I can do. So, for example, um, I can take a call option that expires um, December of 2019, so December of this year, uh, with a $25,000 strike price. Um, And this option on LedgerX is around $500 right now. So if I am a, maybe I'm a long holder or maybe I am somebody new to Bitcoin that wants to get um, upside exposure, but I might be a little bit worried about having as much capital at risk if I buy you know, Bitcoin at 10,000 and I know that it can go down to uh, you know, 7,000, 6,000 just because it is a volatile asset. Uh, I might instead decide to buy a call option for $500. Um, the most I could lose is that $500. And if uh, if Bitcoin does rally significantly, um, then I can make, uh, you know, essentially have that upside uh, exposure and, um, and still make money uh, with a big rally. Yeah, I saw an interview that Ari Paul did with CNBC when he had purchased call options for um, 50K Bitcoin by the end of 2018. This was, in, and he had purchased them, I guess, in December 2017. And the CNBC anchors were very confused, like, why would you do this? And he was like, look, I view it as a way of, you know, because he he runs Block Tower Capital, uh, one of the crypto funds. He He was like, I view it as a way of being able to capture upside if, Bitcoin does, you know, go, go up. And yet, during this time when maybe there is volatility, and maybe uh, the price could could drop, you know, like 80% or whatever, that I would be able to to hold fewer Bitcoins on my balance sheet, and keep my uh, the assets of my LPs from, you know, from dropping that 80% or whatever it might be. And, um, you know, he was just like, this is a way to, yeah, to sort of like limit the downside exposure. And I think he only paid 3600 for that. And so, you know, it's a nominal amount for the size of his fund. And um, yet, you know, at that time when Bitcoin was 20000 and he just was like, okay, is this a bubble? Is it not? He didn't know. He thought, okay, if it's higher than uh, 50K at the end of uh, 2018, you know, then I'd, I'd like to to make sure I, I have... I have that in my fund. Um, All right. So now let's do the opposite. Let's, and and also let's clarify one other thing, which is I think that, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think that normally people use call options for those kinds of bets where they expect that, or not that they expect, but they want to uh, ride any trends upwards, right? Like call options are generally uh, for prices that are higher than what it's currently trading at. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes, in terms of okay. the uh, in terms of the contracts that people typically trade for call options, it's with higher strike prices. Okay, so now let's talk about a put option. What is that again? You know, define it and then walk me through uh, why someone might prefer to buy a Bitcoin put option over Bitcoin. So a put option is to use the academic definition again, the right but not the obligation to sell Bitcoin at a certain price on a certain date in the future. And so put options are very often used for people almost as insurance, um, where they're using them to protect uh, their downside. So uh, it could be maybe if it's, you know, if we're talking about a fund or um, even an individual that has Bitcoin and they are a little bit worried maybe um, about some short-term decline or, um, you know, or 
the some of the headline risks that could cause Bitcoin to fall significantly. They might buy a um, you know maybe a an eight thousand strike put option. And so what they're doing is they're um, buying insurance so that if something does happen and um, Bitcoin goes to six thousand, well now they have the right to sell Bitcoin at eight thousand, and so they. Um, kind of protected their position in a way. And the benefit of a put option similar to um, a call option is that you'll never lose more than you pay for the option. And now, so I give the example of Ari, who's running a crypto fund. What are some other examples of the kinds of people who buy these options and, you know, why? Well, I think the um, actually the the crypto fund I think is an interesting uh, example that ties in um, puts and calls because I think the the Ari example is one that shows how unintuitively um, you know buying call options, which is ostensibly a bullish, very positive type of trade, can actually when you tie in the world outside of it, um, can actually be slightly you know bearish in a way um, if the alternative is essentially sizing down a um, a Bitcoin position and then just having some levered upside calls um, in case, you know, you get benchmarked to Bitcoin and you don't want to miss out on the rally. Um, so I think funds use both puts and calls for a wide variety of um, trading around their positions. You know, I think we've seen in volatile environments, we tend to see more um, hedging, particularly uh, if people on, let's say they're selling options and can capture some of the volatility premium. And then in low volatility environments, like last uh, last year, maybe July, August, um, we see both uh, trading shops as well as companies even um, using options as a way to uh, find more interesting trading opportunities when they don't think there's enough opportunity in just trading Bitcoin itself. Um, but I think one of the uh, really key pieces of um, the participant base for us uh, are customers like miners and individuals who are long holders, um, you know, may have been in Bitcoin for a while or maybe recently. And the reason that those are um, crucial is because they touch the physical, you know, um, miners obviously touch the physical, they deal in it every day. And so they're the reason that we found it so important that we have to deal in the physical in order to provide them with these um, hedging instruments that actually make sense for them. And elaborate on that, like why, and, and this is actually something I was wondering too. So in contrast, the Bitcoin futures contract that trades on CME is what's called cash settled, meaning that at the end of the trade, instead of getting Bitcoin back, you get like the dollar equivalent of of what the uh, the value was of that trade. Um, so for a miner, just describe, you know, why that's a bad thing for them, like like why they would prefer something physically settled. So miners have, um, you can almost think of them like um, like similar to, to gold, for example. But so Bitcoin miners, they invest, you know, dollars in their infrastructure and then they earn a fixed number of Bitcoin. And so that Bitcoin um, is, you know, it's a, obviously the same number of Bitcoin that they earn in the, the mining reward, but the price of it um, as denominated in dollars fluctuates. And so they're exposed to the um, price risk of US dollar versus Bitcoin. And so the cleanest hedge for a miner to hedge that is actually to um, be able to take the physical Bitcoin that they have to pledge it as um, collateral or if they're just going to sell it to sell it and then to earn dollars back as opposed to if they had to essentially take their Bitcoin, convert it to dollars, and then use that dollar for a hedge, and then um, wait for that hedge to, to settle for ca to cash. Um, so it suits, you know, it suits both their price risk, it's a much cleaner hedge, because it's exactly the price risk that they face. And then it suits their operations, because they have Bitcoin, and they're very comfortable sending Bitcoin as collateral, which is, I, I really wouldn't um, underappreciate that point that when you deal in the physical and accepting Bitcoin as a form of collateral is hugely powerful. Um, because, you know, and we see it at Ledger X, anyone can send it 24 seven 365 outside of any banking windows. Let's talk a little bit more about this, you know, physically settled aspect. So how does it work exactly? I, when I decide to uh, buy or sell a, 
a Bitcoin call or put option. You you can pick whichever example it is. Do I literally send you my Bitcoin to do that? And then at that point, what hap- What do you do with it? So you, the options that we have are dollar denominated. Um, so you can either send us dollars and use those dollars to purchase an option, a call option, let's say, or you can send us Bitcoin and um, and sell the Bitcoin on the platform and then use those dollars to um, to purchase the option. Uh, and in either case, we custody uh, the both the fiat and the Bitcoin um, as a centralized custodian. And then once the trade settles. Uh, people are returned what the fiat that they sent if they sent fiat or and then the bitcoin they sent if they sent bitcoin or so yeah so the mechanics are that if you purchase let's say you purchase a call option um let's say the twenty five thousand strike call option um so you purchase it for five hundred dollars so you pay five hundred dollars today and then when it expires in december um if it's in the money so let's say bitcoin is at thirty thousand um then you'll purchase uh, Bitcoin for $25,000. So you'll pay $25,000 and you'll receive one Bitcoin. And then for the person on the other end of that trade, like how, how do you ensure that you'll have the Bitcoin that you can deliver? Yep. So that's exactly what we, um, that's really what we do as a, uh, as a central clearinghouse. So at the time, um, that the seller, uh, does takes the other side of the trade, um, they collect five hundred dollars today, and they're posting one Bitcoin with LedgerX, and LedgerX holds that Bitcoin until the maturity, so that we can guarantee that if you decide to exercise your um, your call option, that we have the Bitcoin. And how do you store all those Bitcoins? Do you put them in some kind of um, cold storage that only you control? That you know, at the time the contract ends, you are the one who decides where the Bitcoin goes, or is it like some kind of multi-sig where like the parties have to sign off or how does that part work? We have to have ultimate control over it. That's the only way that we can accept it as a form of collateral. Okay. And and I'm assuming it's, is it in cold storage? We don't go into too much detail uh, publicly about how exactly we do it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that makes sense. Um, so... Why is it that that Ledger X decided to focus on derivatives? So it, it's kind of twofold. Um, one is that you know I come from an options background, and I really do believe that options are a very important um, piece of the development of a market that you know that is a has elements of being a financial instrument. Um, and we saw you know, companies that were um, in the space that were doing, you know, real, producing real businesses, um, consumer facing, merchant facing, using Bitcoin, remittances, things like that. And in the course of their business, what they were doing is they were warehousing um, Bitcoin on their balance sheet in order to insulate their end customer from the price volatility risk. And so, you know, we kind of thought, one example is that if they had better tools to be able to hedge um, the risk on their balance sheet, similar to how you know large like oil producers do, then they could scale their businesses um, and provide you know more of these um, use cases uh, for Bitcoin to um, to other people. And so we thought that would be good for the ecosystem um, in you know and that these could be used in a wide variety of ways. But there's another element which is that um, we knew. It was a very deliberate uh, approach from a regulatory point of view um, because we didn't want to go down the path of the state by state licenses. Um, we knew that the federal path was going to be harder, um, but we wanted just one federal regulator um, that was a regulator that you know most people would be familiar with and that would have preemption um, over the states. And when you say that uh, you wanted to avoid having to go state by state, that's basically the process that companies like Coinbase, like some of the exchange, the the regular spot exchanges have had to go through. Is that the kind of company that has to do that? Exactly. Yes. And so amongst some of the other exchanges working in crypto derivatives like Bact and Arisex, they're focused on futures. Why is your focus a little bit more on options? 
Well, you know, I think the, um, I think ultimately a lot of, um, other people will, uh, eventually get to, to options as well. Um, you know, for us, it's, and what we see in particular, um, is the, because Bitcoin is so volatile, um, options present opportunity that you can't really get from a linear instrument. And so some of these cases, when we talk about earning yield off of Bitcoin by selling call options, um, that's unique because of Bitcoin's volatility. And options are really, I think, the only way to uh, to both capture the volatility as well as um, to help dampen the volatility over time. Yeah. And just to explain that a little bit more for listeners, uh, when she talks about yield, I think or when you think of, when you're talking about yield, I think what you're referring to is that example of a miner can kind of put up a big like they can I think it's purchase a call option I guess it would be and then they earn uh, the price that the the buyer is paying for that call option. So let's say they earn like five hundred dollars for putting up that Bitcoin, and then um, and then later on if. Uh, the uh, contract is purchased, at least they've sold the the Bitcoin for higher than than what it was at the time that the the call option was made. So like, so let's say Bitcoin is $10,000 now and they do that and then they earn the $500. Um, but then later, if, you know, the the price does go above whatever the strike price is, then um, at least they haven't had to sell the Bitcoin for 10000 You know, they sold it for like 15000 or whatever in the future. Um, is that is that what you mean? There was something about this where, like, when I learned about it, it reminded me a little bit of like MakerDAO and how people put up ETH as collateral and get DAI, which is pegged to U.S. dollars in the meantime. I'm not super familiar with MakerDAO, but um, in the case of what you were saying for the um, the call options, that's correct. So a miner would a miner would sell a call option. They would collect. $500 today for that $25,000 strike. And then if when at expiration, Bitcoin is at uh, above 25000 then they'll sell Bitcoin for $25,000, um, which they might prefer to if they had to sell uh, you know, some of their Bitcoin today at 10000 And then if Bitcoin's below 25000 then they just get their Bitcoin back um, and they can you know, do that trade again. And so they can essentially earn um, that's you know, $500 over a uh, like five-month period. One other way that I wanted to ask about, so earlier with the futures, you know, I seemed to just with my question, it sort of felt like it was to me uh, that it would be preferable to me to um, receive, you know, the to have a physically settled uh, contract where I am receiving Bitcoin back simply because it's so volatile. It would be like, oh, maybe if I did a trade, but then later I might realize that like a day later, I would have gotten a lot more money for it or something. Do you know what, uh, like if, if it were settling in dollars as opposed to Bitcoin. But then another thing was that um, just from the purchaser's perspective, they also have the flexibility of like whether or not to, to actually buy on the expiration date. Right. Like as far as I understand, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, Yep, with that's, the that's correct. Put on. Yeah. For, so, yeah. so that also gives the purchaser more flexibility. So why, so it just feels like um, cash settled derivatives are always going to be superior. Sorry, opposite. Physically settled derivatives will always be superior to cash settled. Is that correct? Yeah, I think so. I think that's absolutely correct. Oh, Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, I that's why we're, I, yeah. And, and I think the, you know, the reason that um, I think some people go down the route of cash settled is because it is easier. It's much easier to get to launch um, because it's easier from a regulatory point of view, you know, because the regulators are already comfortable with holding cash and um, to some degree settling to cash, though arguably settling to cash in this market, as you alluded to, is not um, very prudent. But um, but yeah, I, I think especially especially in a market like Bitcoin, where the physical is so easy to move, you know, uh, physical commodities in general are very, very important markets. And that's coming from markets where it's actually difficult to store and move the physical commodity. Um, but Bitcoin has, you know, has that in spades. Right. I think I was reading one of your blog posts or something and um, you, you talked about how it's not like you have to deliver a barrel of crude at the end of the trade. Right. Um, all right. So let's dive a little bit more into Omni then. 
so the, you know, this is the platform where both retail uh, and institutional customers can actually interact in the same marketplace. Um, before launching Omni, I think customers on your platform needed to have a minimum of $10 million in assets. And now there's actually no net worth requirement. Uh, if I'm, if you know, if correct me if I'm wrong about any of this. Um, so just one thing that made me wonder is, is it desirable from a retail perspective to have the entity that you're trading with be an institution? Like, is there some way that they could be at a disadvantage because they don't have the same tools? Or does that really not apply here? I, I think in general, you know, and, and I'll abstract from this even a little bit because I come from the high frequency trading background, um, which is, you know, obviously gets a lot of these types of questions. And I think in general, having institutions is much better for retail liquidity. You know, institutions are, um, they're out there on multiple platforms, um, hedging very efficiently. And so that just provides better and better um, pricing for retail. What price or index are you guys using to determine whether or not the the price actually hits the strike price for any specific contract? Because as we've seen, the crypto space has, you know, a lot of fake trading and there are flash crashes. And we even saw, uh, apparently, I, I saw on Twitter, at least, um, I did not look into this myself, but it from a fairly credible source that it looks like there might have been people who were manipulating prices on Bitstamp in order to profit on BitMEX. So how can you guys determine whether or not a price is legitimate and isn't being manipulated for profits on Ledger X? Yeah, I mean it's a huge uh, it's a huge issue with um, with spot markets and with overseas exchanges. And you know, so outside of surveilling our own markets, um, the beauty of our products is if we go back to that example of you bought a call option for five hundred dollars um, with a twenty five thousand dollars strike price. When expiration comes, you get to decide if you want to exercise that option um, and pay twenty five thousand dollars to buy Bitcoin. So all Ledger X does is we just do the delivery of the trade, but we don't make any determination as to whether that option is you know in the money or essentially whether Bitcoin is above twenty five thousand or below. We leave that up to whoever the long holder is, and so that way um, they can factor in uh, different you know exchanges, different things they see, and um, and make the determination that they think is appropriate. Oh, oh, okay. Wow. That's, <laughs> that's uh, pretty genius and probably a load off your back. And Ledger X is saying that it will never charge any fees for trades. So if that's the case, how do you make money? So I think um, Paul went into this a little bit on one of his um, blog posts. So for Omni, there are no fees. Um, and then for the institutions, we charge on the on their side um, for um, essentially a maker fee. So the, the Omni uh, has no side in, uh, no fees in taking. And so that's, you know, we make the, the money off the institutions. And as Paul alluded to, the institutions, um, you know, like the professional traders, they price it in anyway. And so um, it's kind of part of our way to just keep a, uh, the fee schedule is very transparent. Um, you know, the price that you pay is um, is what you're getting for it um, and not having, uh, and then, you know, on the institutional side, they know exactly what they're paying and they price it in. So we make it on that side. And you have a wait list of about 3,000 people, I believe. So why why is there a wait list at all? Well, I mean, so for us, as we work through um, adding, you know, uh, users, there's a whole host of um, operational and regulatory, um, you know, additional items that we just want to make sure we get completely right. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we get really good feedback on for um, the Ledger X institutional platform is that um, people have had just a really good experience. And so we want to make sure that as Omni customers come on, everyone, um, all of our stakeholders from the customer all the way down to the regulators and the banks um, are also continue to be very happy with the Ledger X experience. And you launched with 15 institutions in 2017. How many institutions do you have on your platform now? Uh, it's about 250 now. And I saw that Paul said recently in an interview on Cheddar that the institutional market has been slower to materialize and that Ledger X thinks the opportunity is in the retail market. Why do you guys think that? And what does the size of that opportunity look like? So, you know, I think for us from 
first to kind of put institutional into context, you know, um, as you mentioned, our requirements are around $10 million or more in assets. And so we, we definitely see significant interest in, um, maybe the smaller size institutions, but for what people traditionally refer to as, you know, financial institutions getting to the very, very large, um, you know, hedge funds and investment banks. I think Bitcoin's market cap is still not um, large enough for the opportunity to be meaningful to them. You know, even at 200 billion, um, that's just the size of a stock, really. Um, and so it's not really feasible for them to devote a whole bunch of resources for a trading desk for something like this um, when it is still pretty small an opportunity and when they can kind of wait and then throw more res- resources at it later when it's larger. Um, so we see um, the you know the opportunity on the other end of the spectrum. But that said, you know, two hundred billion um, in market cap is still uh, a lot. Uh, that's really big to a small company like um, like Ledger X and to to some of our customers. And so um, we're seeing you know we had a record uh, second quarter. We're seeing um, a ton of demand that is um, really meaningful to us. And when you say record second quarter, what was the volume? Uh, it was about two hundred million worth of uh, derivatives traded and cleared in the second quarter. Great. So we're going to discuss some of the more unique contracts on the platform, as well as regulation in a moment. But first, a quick words from the sponsors who make this show possible. Will the world follow France and advocate banning privacy coins? Will government-backed stablecoins become the new fiat? Are distributed and peer-to-peer exchanges just a flash in the pan? The answer is maybe. Virtual currencies can flourish and create a new, private, and more versatile economy, But that grand vision can't happen without keeping crypto clean. And that requires support of government and accountability for bad actors. Privacy-enhanced compliance using cryptographic controls has the potential to preserve anonymity without compromising legitimate investigations. CypherTrace is working on this vision of the future. Sign up to stay up to date on the Privacy-Enhanced Compliance Initiative and receive authoritative crypto AML reports quarterly. www.cyphertrace.com slash keep crypto clean. Today's episode is brought to you by Kraken. Kraken is the best exchange in the world for buying and selling digital assets. With all the recent exchange hacks and other troubles, you want to trade on an exchange you can trust. Kraken's focus on security is utterly amazing. Their liquidity is deep and their fee structure is great with no minimum or hidden fees. They even reward you for trading so you can make more trades for less. If you're a beginner, you will find an easy on-ramp from five fiat currencies. And if you're an advanced trader, you'll love their 5x margin and futures trading. To learn more, please go to kraken.com. That's K-R-A-K-E-N dot com. When buying crypto, price matters. With the Crypto.com app, you can buy more than 40 coins at true cost. Our multi-exchange trading engine ensures the lowest possible prices to buy crypto with no fees or markups. Not only is the app good for buying crypto, it's also good for growing crypto. You can earn up to 8% per year on BTC, ETH, XRP, and more when you make a deposit into the one-month, three-month, or flexible terms. You just have to deposit your crypto to begin. Interests are paid out weekly and immediately available for use. Start earning through the Crypto.com app. Available on the App Store and Google Play. Back to my conversation with Juthika Chow of LedgerX. So something I was curious about was what would happen if a Bitcoin hard fork happened during the period of a contract? Like, let's say that... um, you had had these physically settled contracts trading on August 1st, 2017. Like who would have kept the Bitcoin cash that resulted from the Bitcoins that were in your possession at that time or or like for any airdrops or anything like that? How How do you guys handle that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we have a, uh, you know, we had posted, um, especially at, around the time when there are a lot of hard forks, uh, our, a general approach to our hard fork policy. Um, the short answer is that there is no clear answer because it really does depend on each fork. Um, it depends on our ability to, um, to, it depends on the forked coin. It depends on if uh, if that's traded on an exchange. It depends if that has regulatory um implications as well. Like if somebody forks 
Bitcoin into something that resembles a security. Um, it depends on the security of the the forked coin itself. So, you know, it is in general um, as a centralized custodian, the value you know should accrue to our participants. But in each case, I mean, I believe there was a fork, a specific fork that we actually gave our specific guidance on that should be somewhere on our website. Um, but we really have to take it case by case at this point. So let's talk about something else that's kind of unique to this space, which is that you guys have a Bitcoin having contract in which people can trade contracts that I guess are like sort of basically bets on what on the one I can't even speak today on when the next halving will be. And um, for people who aren't aware of what halving is, it's when the block rewards, which is the number of new Bitcoins that are minted by the software every 10 minutes, that's when those rewards will be cut in half. So right now it's 12.5 Bitcoins that are released every 10 minutes. Um, and at some point next year, like in the spring, uh, early summer, it's going to be 6.25. So describe for for listeners how this Bitcoin having contract works. Yeah, it's a it's so it's a pretty as you kind of mentioned it's a pretty straightforward um, contract on uh, when the happening will occur. So it's uh, it pays off uh, if the happening occurs before um, a certain date, the contract pays off, um, and then if it doesn't, it ends up in zero. So it's a binary contract in that way. And who is trading that contract, and why would they like? Why would they want to bet on that? How does that help them? Well, so, you know, we can always come back to um, the case of uh, of miners, for example, who have obvious exposure to the happening. Um, and then, you know, all other participants, I mean, I think some people sort of look at the happening as um, possibly a catalyst for uh, for Bitcoin price appreciation based on um, what's happened at happened at previous happenings, um, as well as just, you know, if there's a view that uh, as the mining reward goes down, transaction fees go up. A lot of both businesses and individuals um, and companies have exposure to the happening. And so being able to um, to hedge that exposure, you know, in um, in a pretty direct way, uh, you know, hedging when it'll happen is is important to customers. And so just so I understand it, from the mindset of a miner, it's a little bit like, okay, if the block reward gets cut earlier than I expected and my revenue goes down earlier than I expected, then essentially I can make a little bit of money that, you know, off this, off this contract. Is that sort of why they're purchasing it? Yep, exactly. Um, and so it would be exactly that. So, so if the, you know, let's say, um, it happens like a month or two earlier, then the contract pays out, um, which, you know, would hopefully offset some of the loss from the um, the reward going down sooner than expected. And so this having contract is based on the technicals of the network. What are some other examples of types of contracts you could imagine that are also unique to crypto assets that, you know, because because like this contract, you couldn't have this in a normal uh, in traditional financial services, right? Like this is something unique to the crypto asset space. So are there other examples of kind of contracts you guys could imagine offering that are related to technicals of networks? Well, I think the, um, I think something that settles to the difficulty is um, a very intriguing contract um, from my point of view. And we've kind of actually already designed the specifications. And what's great is, I mean, we talked a little bit about uh the susceptibility to manipulation when it comes to spot exchanges and cash settle contracts. And I think uh, physically settled are obviously a lot better because uh, as you mentioned, you just get the Bitcoin, you don't have that exposure. But um, I mean, you take a contract that settles the difficulty of a particular block and that's uh, nearly impossible to manipulate. So it's um, a super clean settlement. And I think it's something that people would both, again, have exposure to, like if you're a miner, but also um, be interested in speculating on. Um, so I think difficulty contracts, and then uh, I think in the future, transaction fee contracts as well. Oh, this sounds so interesting. I, I kind of love this. I think this is fascinating. And it, it I don't know, at a certain point, it gets kind of creative and fun, um, I think. So I look forward to seeing what you guys do. Um, so another contract that you guys recently introduced was one for a $100,000 Bitcoin by December 2020. And I saw in the article on this, that it was in Bloomberg, that there was a demand for such a contract from institutional customers with assets between $10 million and $1 billion. So is that how you decide on which contracts to introduce? Like, 
people sort of make requests and you see kind of what there's demand for or how, how do you decide? Yeah, we we list the contracts um, and we usually do it in conjunction with um, where we see both direct customer requests and demand, um, as well as where customers trade. So, you know, for example, um, one of the things that surprised me a little bit when we launched LedgerX and as we started scaling it with the institutions was that um, people had much longer dated demand than I initially thought. Um, I I thought it was going to be more that people would want to trade one, two, three month contracts because Bitcoin was so volatile that nobody really knew where it was going to be a lot further out. But um, we're actually seeing you know the opposite. I think most of not most, but a large, large portion of our open interest is in December 2020, um, June 2020. And so uh, we kind of look at some of those patterns and that helps inform um, listing contracts that, you know, uh, that people request. Hmm, that's interesting. I wonder if it's sort of like, you know, the fact that no, that wouldn't make, I guess because you just open a retail investors. I was going to say that maybe this sort of is one way in which kind of this retail market differs from the institutional, but that's not entirely true. Um, one other thing, though, that I did want to mention, uh, and, and not that this is investment advice, um, but when I read that, I couldn't help but think about how in a recent episode, Dan Moorhead of Pantera mentioned that um, I guess his firm had mapped out Bitcoin's price logarithmically over time and then projected out that by the end of, I think it was 2020, yeah, that Bitcoin would hit 122,000. So when I saw that contract, I, it just reminded me of that contract or of his statement. And I thought, okay, well, I guess we'll see. Um, all right. So one other thing that I wanted to ask about this was SIBO stopped listing Bitcoin futures contracts in March. And I noticed that they had pretty small volume compared to CME. Um, in December, their volume was about a quarter million or a little bit less, but it had actually once been as high as about two billion uh, at the beginning of 2018. So, are there any lessons that you guys are trying to draw or can draw from how popular this or how unpopular this contract eventually became? Not really. I mean, we, to be honest, I didn't uh, follow it too, too closely, but I think um, it, you know, perhaps validated some of the positions that we took um, in the past about the the focus on, you know, on physical settlement. Uh, but no, we've just been really focused on, uh, on Ledger X and our participants and just making sure that we have um, a great product that, um, that our participants like using. So I noticed that Ledger X has said before that you guys have intentionally decided not to offer products or services that would require regulation by the SEC. Why not? Well, being regulated is is no joke. Um, it's you know I think we are we're such an interesting company because we're a startup, but we are the licenses that we have. Um, we are held to the exact same standards as uh, you know forty billion dollar companies, and so. Um, I think the regulation is necessary for what we want to do and for providing um, a safe platform to our customers. But um, I don't think we can conceivably uh, run a small business like this having to deal with um, another set of federal regulations. Oh, but was there a reason why you preferred the CFTC over the SEC? Um, it was more that we, uh, we went down the path because we were really focused on Bitcoin. Um, I think some of the, this SEC stuff is more, I think for people who are doing, I, I suppose tokens, but I think more, um, ETFs in particular. Uh, but in the early days, we just took a bet that Bitcoin would be a commodity, um, and fall into the CFTC's jurisdiction. So I know that you guys needed to get two licenses from the CFTC. Can you describe what those two were and what those enable you to do? Yeah, so we actually so we have three licenses now. So we um so oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so a brief so a brief bit of history. So we had two um in July 2017, we got our first two. So we have the swap execution facility, which is the institutional exchange license. Um, and then we got the derivatives clearing organization, which is the clearinghouse. And so that's the 
Uh, that's the one that allows us to custody dollars, to custody Bitcoin. Um, that's where, that's how we kind of guarantee all the trades and hold the collateral to settlement. Um, and then, but the, the swap execution facility is what limited us from not being able to, um, to touch retail. So the third license that we applied for and got was a designated contract market, which allows us to do futures and retail. Um, and so we, at this point, um, we're only really operating the, um, the designated contract market and the derivatives clearing organization because uh, everybody can trade on on both of those. Um, but we, we still have the, uh, the third license because we haven't gotten rid of it yet. I saw that a few years ago, you guys submitted a public comment to the New York State Department of Financial Services requesting that it exclude companies subject to the Commodities Exchange Act from the bit license, but they they did not create that exemption you requested. So do you guys need to apply for a, a bit license? And if so, do you plan to do so? No. So this is a conversation we've actually had with, um, with the CTC and with, um, and with DFS. So we're, this is where having the, um, the federal license really, um, does come in handy because the federal regulators are of the view that they have, um, preemption over state licenses. And I also noticed that you're open to Singapore customers in addition to U.S. customers. So why is Singapore the other jurisdiction that LedgerX is available in? Well, we had, you know, as we started um, looking at other areas to expand to, we really started with the um, the regulators that had uh, good relationships with, you know, the U.S. regulators, particularly the CFTC. And so um, we were able to to get some introductions there and uh, just the, the partnership that they had made it easier for us to do, um, you know, what we wanted to do without... Uh, as compared to you know some of the other um, countries in Asia, where I think we would have needed um, very significant even changes in law from their side um, in order to offer our products. And I also saw that you commented that from a banking point of view, in addition to the regulatory point of view, it was easier to start with in- institutional customers. So I was curious to hear more about this banking issue. I I mean this is. I don't know how well known it is to listeners. Um, maybe I should do a podcast on it. But <laughs> uh, crypto companies typically have a very, very difficult time getting banked. Uh, they often get cut off from their banks. Uh, people who've been following the Bifinex and Tether sagas probably have some inkling of this. Um, but so uh, was that common? It, uh meant to imply that essentially if you have institutional customers that then that kind of makes the banking easier or or at least makes it less likely you'll have your banking cut off I think I mean I think now the environment is a lot better there's you know even in the US I think there's um some banks that are you know public about their involvement in the space but you know we started LedgerX in 2014 and no joke I think Paul and I spent the first nine months of the company just solely focus on getting a bank account and not even a custody account. All we wanted was just an operating account that we could hold our VC money in. Um, and so <laughs> it was it, the the banking, and that lasted for a couple of years. Um, so during that period, uh, as we really, really struggled to get banking relationships and um, find banks that were comfortable with, you know, with the crypto space, the fact that we were focused on institutions was definitely something that we found um, made them a lot more comfortable. But now uh, LedgerX is both, you know, we're proven. I think people are more familiar with us and the, regu- the our regulator, the CFTC. And then there's banks that are much more comfortable um, with crypto. And so now I think it's not as um, not as big a deal, provided that you just have the right regulatory oversight. All right. Well, let's hope for a lot of these startups out there that I think uh, some of them at least are still struggling with this. Um, One thing also that I was curious about just from a regulatory perspective is how how will the trades of Bitcoin futures be taxed? Do you do you have any clarity on that? Yeah. So futures do get the well, so this is not tax advice, but my um, just from what I've kind of seen and read, futures do get twelve fifty six tax treatment, and it's this strange thing. I don't know thing. what that means. So they they get twelve fifty six tax treatment. I'm not sure exactly what that is offhand, um, but it, it is uh, beneficial and preferable to how um, Bitcoin spot gets taxed. Oh, okay. 
Well, that's good because I, I, I feel like that is still a major, major issue that needs to be resolved in the crypto space. Um, so something else that I got curious about was, you know, when you talked about how you guys decided to uh, focus on Bitcoin and that sort of led you to the CFTC, as we've seen, um, Ether, uh, it looks like will be considered a commodity, or at least it's been hinted in various ways that at least it's not a security. So if, if that becomes official, then could you see Ledger X offering derivatives in Ether? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we actually, uh, when I believe it was last summer um, when there was a comment from the SEC, uh, maybe from one of their commissioners about it not being a security, we actually uh, circulated draft um, filing with the CFTC um, for for us to offer Ethereum. Um, and then kind of sh- shortly after that is when it became um, a much more drawn out process as they decided to open up for public comment. So at this point, you know, we're, um, I think we're just going to gonna kind of wait and see. And if the CFTC gives the guidance that it's a commodity, then um, we'll move on it. But otherwise, um, we'll just stay focused on Bitcoin. And, w- and I'm assuming that would also apply to things like Bitcoin Cash, Zcash, or like any of these other digital assets that are somewhat similar to Bitcoin? Correct. Yeah. So we've made it very, very far into the episode without getting into your background. And you've mentioned this mysterious Paul. Um, <laughs> so why don't you um, now kind of, de- and, and also, you know, you guys were so early. So I kind of just want to hear the story of how you came uh, to found Ledger X. Yeah, so we we had been in um, Bitcoin for you know maybe a couple of years before we started Ledger X, and by in Bitcoin I don't mean we were like super active, but we had followed it and you know, traded it here and there and just paid attention to it. Um, and, and before then, that, or not before that, but during this period, explain like where you were working and how. Yeah. Yeah. So I was I was working. So it was actually um two th- sorry it was 2011. Um. So I was working at Goldman at the time. Paul was at Y Combinator on the West Coast. And so this is and when this Bitcoin, is Paul Chow, the Paul Chow, the CEO, yeah, yeah. who's yep, also your husband. Correct. Yeah. And so he got um, exposed to it first. And um, so this was summer of 2011 when there was that price spike up to 30 and then back down. And um, and so we went through the process of. Um, buying our first Bitcoin on uh, Mt. Gox at the time, which was uh, a very, very cumbersome process between getting uh, our funds from Goldman to, I think we used Dewalla to Gox. But once we had Bitcoin, we could just send it um, back and forth, you know, cross coast easily, seamlessly, 24-7. And so we played around with it. Um, We ultimately ended up not um, really doing much with it, both you know, personally and definitely professionally, partly because um, we we both had full time jobs and we didn't really feel comfortable with just you know holding keys on our laptops. So, uh, but we we still found it really interesting. And I think a couple years later, um, there were a couple things that happened. One was that the market cap had appreciated significantly. So you know, it was now. I mean, it was obviously a lot lower than it is here, but it was now approaching a scale where, you know, Coinbase was around and companies were um, moving reasonably reasonable amounts of Bitcoin that could actually start to um, support a derivatives market. And then two was there were these Senate hearings in November of 2013, which were um, our takeaway was fairly positive on Bitcoin and that we thought the regulators were going to take a constructive approach towards regulating Bitcoin. So, um, with those, you know, we had thought about doing derivatives for a while, and um, I think after uh, after those hearings, we um, we just went all in on on Ledger X. Uh, we were early, we were naive. Um, I think I was actually watching a, an interview this morning, and uh, a guy said that one of his biggest advantages was his innocence. Um, and I think you can say that for us too, that uh, we didn't really know how long the process was going to be, but um, but we got through it and you know we're here five, six years later. And I have heard you also talk about uh, navigating this like blockchain, not Bitcoin era. Um, in fact, actually, I want to quote a little bit uh, your husband talking about that period. He said, 
in a blog post, quote, I cannot stand the years of my life wasted in board meetings with morons lecturing me about how private blockchains are going to revolutionize back office technology and suck the air out of the ecosystem for things like Bitcoin. They were right about one thing. They did suck the air out of the ecosystem for a few years, drawing away valuable investment capital that could have been used for legitimate projects in public blockchains. And then toward the end of the post, he says, quote, Wall Street back office technology isn't historically inefficient because they didn't have access to magical blockchains. Wall Street technology sucks because they marginalize technologists. The, and he puts this in quotes, business guys, rule, traders, bankers, these are the, again, quotes, front office guys. Everyone else doing the work of record keeping and coding are called again, quotes, back office. And I imagine these are all air quotes. And they are treated and paid horribly. I've worked on trading floors where traders will throw footballs at the heads of nerdy programmers who are cluelessly being made fun of. So I was curious to know, like, you know, how uh, this period felt for you guys where you were making this bet on Bitcoin and all around you, you know, you're based in New York. You guys have these backgrounds from Goldman. Um, it felt like everybody else was focused elsewhere. How did you navigate that period? Uh, it, it was rough. Um, it, it was, it was a hard period, you know, as, as his post mentioned, you know, it sucked the oxygen out a lot. And I think it was, um, a part of what made it really hard is not just that everybody was focused on, uh, on blockchain, um, which we didn't really believe was uh, a thing without Bitcoin. But, um, you know, you saw a lot of companies like pivoting towards that because that's where the opportunity was. And we were, um, pretty stubborn, um, on sticking to building a product that we believed in. Um, and so it was, uh, definitely a test of our will and resilience. Uh, but, I guess I'm glad, you know, it's it sort of has died down. And I think, you know, I think ultimately one of the things that really, um, there were, there were a couple of reasons why we were so set on it. Um, one is we were pretty sure that we we're right just from a first principles, um, technical point of view, but two is I'm a markets driven person. And if Bitcoin was really nothing, then the market would have reflected it. But the, you know, even while all of this was going on, the price still stayed, um, at, at some, you know, it might've only been like five, $10 billion, but that's still a lot of market cap that was, um, still sustained even while everyone was talking about how, um, Bitcoin was, you know, worthless and it was all about blockchain. All right. So I also want to ask about a few other offerings you have or or plan to roll out. I saw in a blog post you mentioned that you'll be offering a subscription-based data service that you described as Bloomberg meets Wolfram Alpha. Tell tell us more about that and how that fits into your overall strategy. Yeah, I mean data is always um it's generally been, it's generally an important mar part of markets. Um, and what we want to do with that is not just make the data available, but we want to make it um, approachable, you know, particularly options data. I mean, if we, I can, you know, say that, oh, the December 25,000 um, strike call expiring in, uh, let's say, 2020 is, you know, $2,000 bid at $3,000, but that doesn't really mean much to you. Um, and so what we're trying to do is how do we, you know, how can we make, take this data that we have that's incredibly rich and make it um, approachable and meaningful to folks. And so we've launched on our website a very, very uh, early crude version of this called the LedgerX Oracle, which is kind of something that you can just talk to. You know, you can just ask it questions, ask it what's the chance that Bitcoin will be above 10,000 a month from now. Um, and it, it takes these probabilities and it pulls them from the options data that we have. And so we want to really um, expand that um, over time and make it something that people can talk to, but that they can get um, real live options pricing um, driving behind it. And another product you have is called the LXVX. What does that indicate and how do you construct that? It's a volatility index. It's about, it's roughly a 30 day volatility index. So we construct it from, um, the usually front, you know, one or two months of options that are listed. And that's designed to give, um, people a sense of what Bitcoin implied volatility is. So realized volatility is looking historically at how much Bitcoin has moved. Um, what the LXVX tells us is what is the market pricing for where they think volatility will be over the next 30 days. And so that's an important metric, um, even to people who may not trade options per se. Maybe they are only trading Bitcoin, or maybe they just 
run a business in the Bitcoin space and they want to know how much uncertainty is being priced in. And so that's um, that index is uh, is designed to give the market a sense of what traders are uh, estimating or forecasting for future volatility. And the last thing I wanted to ask about in terms of the products in your site was the Ledger X pit. What is that and what happens in the pit? Yeah, the pit is, um, it's, it, it, this is another one that um, I think I found very interesting. So uh, if you humor me, I'll just tell a really quick story. So when I was at Goldman, I um, started in high frequency trading. And so it was electronic, it was highly efficient, um, algorithmic. And I worked there for um, five years from uh, 2006 to 2011. And I remember towards the end of my time there, um, I just remember wondering why markets hadn't fully gone electronic because it was so much more efficient. Um, and so I didn't really understand it. And so then I moved to the Goldman Franchise Desk, um, which is the desk that's client facing. And I got a completely different perspective of trading, which is that it's not necessarily just about the um, just the efficiency and cutting latencies and getting, you know, a fraction of a penny better here and there. A lot of it is social and a lot of the experience that people have is better um, when they know who they're dealing with. You know, when it's anonymous trading, I think people tend to assume the worst intentions, um, not give people the benefit of the doubt, not treat people as well. But when it's not anonymous, um, it's a much richer experience. And we noticed that um, through Ledger X because our, we have a block trading mechanism, which is done um, directly between participants and then we clear it. Uh, and we noticed that this was becoming uh, a much richer experience, that people were using this mechanism, even if they could get the same kind of pricing on the screens, um, but just because of the experience. And so the pit is designed to be a virtual pit, really. Um, it's similar to uh, the Chicago trading pits and uh, the way that people interact there and the way that they play the long game. You know, it's not so much, let me just do this one trade and try to screw over the other side. It's, you know, you have a lasting relationship. You're going to have to uh, deal with these people going forward. So um, kind of playing playing the long game there. And so that's what the, the pit is designed to do um, for our uh, institutional customer base. I love that. That's a great lesson from your Goldman days. And one other thing that I was curious about was I believe that um, you worked at Goldman during the financial crisis. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So do you think that that kind of affected your interest in Bitcoin? And if so, like, or, or, you know, regardless of, of whether or not it did, like, how do you take that experience, um, you know, in this venture? Like, how does it affect how you plan to manage Ledger X? I think the, the biggest thing that I got out of that experience was just realizing how uh, bad things can get very quickly. Um, and so it just, you know, I think in my current role, you know, running a mission critical operation, um, it's kind of good to have that healthy amount of, um, of paranoia and just realizing, you know, what, what can go wrong, um, and, and how badly things can go wrong really quickly as we saw with the economy in, in 2008. I don't know that it, you know, maybe, maybe years later as I, you know, in 2011, I think when I got, uh, um, introduced to Bitcoin, I think I had more of an appreciation for it because of having, um, gone through 2008. But, um, you know, obviously at the time I didn't really, even though that's around when the white paper came out, um, I wasn't really aware of it till a little bit later. All right. Well, where can people learn more about you and Ledger X? Uh, so Ledger X on our website and, um, I am recently on Twitter. Uh, so my Twitter handle is just my first name, Juthika. Okay, great. Well, thanks for coming on Unchained. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for joining us today. To learn more about Juthika and Ledger X, check out the show notes inside your podcast player. If you're not yet subscribed to my other podcast, Unconfirmed, which is shorter and a bit newsier, be sure to check that out. Also, find out what I think are the top crypto stories each week by signing up for my weekly newsletter at unchainedpodcast.com. You can sign up right on the homepage. Unchained is produced by me, Laura Shin, with help from Factual Recording, Anthony Yoon, Daniel Ness, and Rich Straffolino. Thanks for listening.